Hmm. You know, as much as I love Kamen Rider, and I do love me some Kamen Rider, I will never get used to that kind of narrative full of flesh as long as I live. Oh, come on! Why is Yuki still in the end credits? He just died, and you're gonna show him dancing like nothing happened? Jeez. <sighs> I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm bored. I wonder what the others are up to. Speak of the devil. Hey guys, what's up? Yo. What's up, Brian? Morning, sleepy hat. It's only what? 1 p.m. now? Wait, what? That can't be right. I'm usually up no later than nine on the weekends. No, whatever it was you were up to all night doing, it was enough to practically put you into a coma, my dude. We made breakfast and kept shaking you, inviting you to go out to grab barbecue supplies for tonight. But you just kept murmuring on about how the attacks are never gonna stop your sleep or something. Yeah, and to be perfectly honest, it was really starting to freak us out. So we just kind of left you there. You know, somehow I'm not as upset by that as I feel like I should be. Also, sorry, I didn't mean to worry you guys with my sleep talk. I was working late last night on a new tracking device component for a satellite we're launching soon. I guess I had prior events on my mind or something. Wait, how long were you guys gone anyways? I don't know. Three, four hours tops. You must have really needed your beauty sleep, sir, worries a lot. I mean, after all we've been through, as many precautions as we've initiated, can you really blame me? Well, in any case, I mean... I know we're always on guard for any kind of attack, but we've been pretty lucky so far this season. So whatever you've been working on must be working properly. I mean, it does seem like some of the threats we've had to face kind of went away. Mike, don't jinx it, man. <laughs> All right, so let's see here. Looks like today we're reviewing... What the hell was that? Everyone okay? Sasha, status report. Brian... Survey the area for damages. Mike, we need to make sure this isn't some kind of multi-dimensional thing occurring through all the threads of reality at once. Hail alt Sasha ASAP. To think that this used to be where I'd say to cut back on the sci-fi. I'm on it. Sasha, you got anything yet? Whatever it is, our beacons aren't picking up anything out of the ordinary. And there's seemingly nothing weird that we would have been looking out for. But further analysis out of our readout shows that there's nothing there, even though something was. Like, it just came out of thin air. Uh, guys? Should the walls and the furniture and the, well, everything be in black and white instead of color? What? Oh, God, now not again with the color crap. Yeah, everything over here is looking like a silent film, too. Something heavy damage in multiple corridors, energy and water cut off to those areas. Whatever that explosion was, it wasn't just someone firing off the surplus 4th of July stash. Ben, I'm going to need you to send me some schematics from your console. Copy that. Just one set. What's this? Error, ranger, color, not recognize. What? I'm locked out of my station because it's not recognizing my ranger color? What the? Me too. I can't even log in to check my Facebook and see if anyone else is reporting this. What in Kirby's name is going on here? Son of a... Yep, I got logged out too. Only heard a snippet of what alternate Sasha had to say before the connection terminated. Brian, who designed these control panels? Um, I did. Okay, let me ask you another question. Why in the hell did you decide that something as critical as a mission control panel should be locked and unlocked using a ranger color. Okay, look, to be fair, I did not expect us to keep changing colors like this every season. Aside from Sasha, I've had to reprogram our control panels every single time we focus on a new season because for some reason, we have to keep changing the Roy G. Biv pecking order around here. Here's what I don't get. You kept the color functionality even after all the color shenanigans that we've been through. After everything was turned blue or pink. Pink, Brian! <laughs> and mean... not just after the first time did you not think to do that, but it's also happened a second time, too. Now, we're on our third installment of our color shenanigan misadventures, and we can't access life-saving computer programs because you didn't feel like changing it? Whoa, 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 hold on. First off, is that really what we're calling it now? 
Color shenanigans. Don't look at me, Sasha coined the phrase. <laughs> look, this has nothing to do with me feeling like changing it or not. Do you have any idea the amount of money it would cost to change out the software, let alone the hardware? And to see how our Rangers get out of this one, join us for Turbo, a Power Rangers movie. Everybody and welcome to the season finale for Voices from the Grid Zeo Edition. I'm your host for you this evening, Pink Ranger Brian Massey. You're still not over that, are you? Uh, not really. Yeah. Um, and I am joined by my colleagues, my counterparts, uh, my partners in crime. Uh, let's give it up for first of all the Green Ranger for this season, Ben Taylor, who is mid drink. <laughs> sh- I should have. I should have gauged. Sorry, that. I was necking a beer. Um, <laughs> Yep, yeah, what up? It's me, your boy. Yep. And also joining me is the Blue Ranger for this season, Michael Lindebaum. Yep. And last but certainly not least, our eternal Red Ranger, Sasha Kaplan. Give it up. The one, the only, the ever snarky. Until someone turns all of our stuff pink. Yeah, well. I get my revenge where I can. <laughs> Again. And I'm still living with that. Um. Anyways, so we have <sighs> survived suffered through whatever you want to say with Zio. Um, certainly, Sasha, you and I have stories about watching Tommy sing and croon along with... Uh, I still can oh hear God. his singing ringing in my head. It is that painful. Yeah, But for anybody listening at home, basically what we're going to do is we're going to break down the season and give our thoughts. Mm-hmm. And uh, my first question for everybody in the room, what was this season? A season. Um, it happened. Yeah, it was a series of televisual events that were ma- sometimes linked and sometimes weren't. Yeah, um, and furthermore, uh, did this feel like it was worth the watch? No. And before we get to Turbo, does this season feel like it continues the momentum that was built by MMPR to lead to an optimistic future for the franchise, or could this have been a potentially disastrous season that der- derailed the franchise altogether? So, not to give out. The, the snarky one-word answers, because that would be far too easy. Right. I said in our season intro... Mm-hmm. Spoiler alert, we recorded it last night. <laughs> um, <laughs> that this was the bravest move the franchise had made to date. Right. Right? So it had every possibility that was just going to fail. Yeah. I can't speak for the majority of people... Because, again, I watched it for the first time when I was 41. Right. But it had to succeed on some level for there to be a turbo and an in space. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, personally, I remember watching it as a kid, and um, I knew a lot of kids that were upset by the costume change. I was kind of okay with it, actually. But as far as this season goes, re-watching it, it's like... yeah, the, the, the rose-tinted glasses are shattered underneath my yeah. feet at this point. I was like, oh, God, this is a... This is Do you not remember the when we were leaving Mighty Morphin Season 3 and we were like, oh, my God, finally, Zio. We're so ready for... We yeah. were so ready for Zio. We had no idea I've what we were getting into. I've got a genuine question for you. Yeah. Was Mighty Morphin Season 3 better than Zio? Oh, my God. I, th- I think <laughs> I enjoyed it a little better. <laughs> If I'm being completely honest with you, I mean, it actually gave Adam dialogue, so that counts. He had he had more than one focal episode too. Which I think is there's only one focal more... episode for Zio. Did he even get a focal episode in Zio? Well, there's instruments of destruction, right? Oh, and there's the uh, and the one screen. you and I reviewed, Ben. Oh, all right. Screen. And there's a kind of a mean screen with yep. the first time we meet um, Raymond. Raymond, 
right. the hero of this season. He's only in like three or four episodes. Three episodes. Um, what were you going to say, Mike? Oh no, I was going to say um, that like when we looked at you know season three, they were doing all these long form storytelling to get us to places that we need to be, like getting rid of Kim, getting to the point of like introducing the alien rangers and then introducing the zeo crystals and stuff like that and giving then, us a different bad guy to yeah. temporarily yeah. so we can get used to yeah the so yeah yeah so it was like it was literally building for all these major story arcs that we knew were connected but then like when we go into picking the episodes that we want to do and ben going i don't want to do anything involving tommy but because they didn't structure the season the same way like the previous season. Well, no, my my phrase was, I don't want anything to do with the Tommy Arrowhead arc. And you end up still getting one episode. Yes, because somehow <laughs> someone gave me the title. Spoiler alert, it was Mike. The one that was titled, Brother, Can You Spare an Arrowhead? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we suffer through that one together, that's Ben. A, it's a, fine. But, but in all fairness, I had to suffer through the first three. Look, that's your problem. But anyway, you're, but you're anyways, not as, you're not as vocal a detractor of Tommy as I. But any, but anyways, but the thing is though is that when you came into this season, they did story arcs that were all centered they, around. But they're either a multi-part episodes that were always centered around Tommy, or if they did do a story arc, they did one which was kind of half. Yeah. thrown together which was Billy when Billy left and then come, came back yeah. because that was kind of when they're introducing Raymond. It wasn't really a story arc. It yeah. was just Billy left and Billy came back. Yeah. Yep. Well then tell you what I'm going to go ahead and jump around a little bit. Uh, jump jump, jump for around. My, for my next question um, kind of starts off as a statement. This really kind of became the Tommy show starring JDF as Tommy Oliver featuring the other Power Rangers it felt like. The, did it not? The, this, yep. this season several seasons ago. Yeah. But, but here's the thing though but, like, but but like compared to past seasons this one was the more painfully obvious one. Sure. Because well keep in mind I mean keep in mind the pre last season they did a whole story arc on Kim and putting more focus on Kim and Kat than they did on You Tommy. say that but JDF was the focus of that storyline because Kat was in love with him. But he was playing more of that support character because you're too many people. still so- they set in the slap bang in the center of the web. They couldn't put like Billy in the center of the web. No, that would be far too sensible. So I do have a little more to that question. Um, and I do, def- I'm definitely wrote this with you in mind. Which Rangers do you think were criminally underwritten this time around? Adam seems to get very little to do here. And Tani seems to just fill Aisha's shoes without much in the way of a personality change. I think definitely Adam 100% top of the list. The fact that there were so many episodes where Adam just like didn't have dialogue. And not only that. But and it's no, it's very noticeable, mostly because, you know, we are fans of Adam. We've yeah. talked a lot about it. And he's just like. Quick like, Power Ranger all the time. Right. So but, it was weird. But on top of that, Tanya got more than Adam did. Yep. But a lot of the stuff with Tanya just that was kind of out of necessity, but, though. But but, this, but the thing with Tanya, a lot of it just didn't make sense. Sure, like how the hell did Do she want to go into a culture shock? Where no, right no, 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 no. We had that we in the premiere. We're, we're good. We're we're we've good. done the culture shock, but like, how the hell did she get a boyfriend so damn fast? I, I, they have boyfriends and girlfriends in Africa. I'm it's pretty really right. not well, like, that hard. She literally a- got a boyfriend in, in episode three. She's a pretty yeah. girl. Right, Boys are the, stupid. But, like, but I don't what know. We're trying to, but what, I think what Mike and I are trying to say is there are other stories you could tell with Tanya first. Yes. That's true. Okay. That's a going great straight, point. Then like, go straight to the But boyfriend. it's not like the writers of the show really know what teenagers are like, except... <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> right? But, like, teenagers, they look 20, right? But, like, I, but let's stick to Tanya for a second. Like, they gave her the boyfriend, like, episode three. Yeah, and it kind of plays off a little bit in like maybe like two, three other episodes later down the road. Why couldn't that be its own like little four episode story arc of Tanya? Because this character Sean that was brought in as the boyfriend, he actually was used at one point as a red herring. Speaking of boyfriends and Tanya, yeah, I know you and I talked about this, right? But am I the only one that detected that they were trying to hint towards something between her and Adam? Oh. I pointed that out. You and I also talked about it on some of the episodes we recorded because it was, yeah. Here's here's another, like, weird theory I had, too. Do you think that there was a chance, because, what was it? Um, Karen Ashley, she kind of dropped a bombshell on them, like, really, really, like, suddenly, hey, I'm leaving the show. 
And do you think it could have been that the Zeo scripts had been written and they were going to give her a boyfriend in Zeo had she stayed on the show, but then they had to do all this other stuff. And by the time that they got to episode three, they were just like, eh, screw it. I think you'll find that a lot of Tanya's, sorry, Aisha's stories got transferred to Kat. Sure. Because there's an episode where Kat trains a dog. Right. Oh, right. yeah. Right. And that's perfectly an Aisha story. It, 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 but the funny thing for that is that could have easily have gone to Tanya because of where Tanya came from yeah, in story sure. lore. So, like, why couldn't that be put on Tanya? Exactly. Well, because Tanya yeah. was very busy playing basketball and training with Adam. And then she was very busy with her boyfriend. And then she was very busy with her singing career. And playing and baseball. And fashion design stuff she and Kat were doing. Because there's nothing she can't do. There's really, the, like, though. The Rangers literally play every freaking sport. Not, not every sport. sport. No, but, but Tanya <laughs> Yeah, nobody's played badminton. Right? Yeah. No. Tanya specifically, <laughs> over the course of Zio, she, she legitimately has... A baseball career. She's really good at martial arts. She's super good at uh, maths. Mm. She's really into computers. She has a possibly a singing career, and that's just the first ten episodes. Yep. Like, <sighs> yeah. But it to was- answer your actual question, Rangers, I think, that, or characters, I think, were criminally underused this season. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna say Rocky. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Rocky, Rocky, Rocky had really the the much. plant episode, but he, he had the Aubrey <laughs> two episode. He also had that annoying episode after Jason is introduced, mm-hmm. where he's Vulcan's called sort of egg him on, and he becomes very like upset that like oh Jason is back, and Jason was the Red Ranger when I before me, and he's gonna replace me kind of stuff. But that's kind of a good thing to have though, because it brought, brought self doubt to him. Was the <laughs> Was the episode, and you can tell how much I actually care about Zio because I can't remember his episodes in this season. The episode where he and the blind girl. Ooh, that was a really good episode. You say that. It was a nice Rocky episode. Yeah. I mean, compared to what we had to deal with this season, that was a better written episode. Fair enough. <laughs> I, I mean, I would heartily disagree from the the angle of a disabled person. But carry on. No, you would. Well, that's why people will go back and listen to our discussion of that. But yeah. I think compared to some of the episodes that that's we got, true. it yeah. was still better. But you and I dissected that episode really well. There was another Adam centric episode that we all forgot about. It came from Angel Grove. I didn't forget about it. You just didn't oh, yeah. let me say anything. It's absolutely probably one of the top two episodes. In yeah. fact. Going back thinking about it, my top two episodes of the season are both Adam centric episodes. Shocker! Instrument Shocker of destruction. Of the century. Huh? Instrument of destruction. Instrument of destruction, and it came from Angel Grove. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's not because Adam's the focus character, it's because of everything that's happening around him. Um, I one of actually now that we're on that topic, one of my favorite episodes is the season was the introduction of uh, Gasket and Archerina. Uh, did we mention their names are Gasket and Archerina? <laughs> so 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 playing off of that, my next question is: uh, it revolves around the Machine Empire. Um, so my main question is: who would you have rather seen as the vocal main villains for Zio, King Mondo and uh, Queen Machina, or Prince Gasket and Archerina? Uh, also, overall thoughts on Prince Pocket as a villain. Ben? My point for the villain of Zio should be Zordon. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to elaborate on that for the listeners? Do I need to? <laughs> nope. <laughs> wait, wait, I'm sorry. Was Zordon in this season? Exactly. Uh, um, the, no. Um, he kind of was in this season. It's weird. Right? What? Did um, he do anything is the question. It's a strange question, right? Because you're asking us to compare someone who's there for 90% of the season to someone who's there for a few episodes. Sure. Um, no, 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 no. Add, add one more in there. We that? need to ask Louis Kaboom. Oh, God. <laughs> no, no, we don't. <laughs> that dude was so annoying. So annoying. Anyway. And I was stuck doing the entire saga with him. I, Thank I did you some very of those much. episodes with you. 
Mike. You and Mike both. I did but... the intro and the outro. We could boom with you. Um, I did the meat. I did the I did the meat yeah. and the sandwich of that. So well, here's what I'm gonna say. Ultimately, King Mondo is a stupid villain. Yes. He's useless. Um, he resorts to the same shtick that Rita and Z- Rita and Zed did. The only person that had any actual interesting plans were Gasket and Archerina, except for like maybe one episode where the with can the, I, can, the can, I, can, I, can I give you a play devil's advocate? For sure. Me? Do you not think had Archerina and Gasket been around for longer, they too would have resorted to Monster of the Week? I don't know, awesome. because their arc sort of doesn't really go anywhere, and then as soon as King Mondo comes by, they're like, oh, we're out now. Um, I think ultimately it's possible, because considering the writing of the show, it's very possible. Yeah. But I think the problem is is that Mondo resorted too quickly to that shtick. Right. It was like the next episode, right? But... All of Gasket and Archerina's plans, very rarely, if as far as I remember, I've already I've already started the the, the part where I block the the, yeah. the bad stuff out of my yep. peripheral yeah. and try to forget about it. So as far as I remember, their plans very rarely, if ever, focused on whatever shtick the Rangers had going on that week. Maybe once, right? But they had legitimate plans that re- involved like having a full scale invasion. Or kidnapping and brainwashing Tommy. That ha- was actually kind of a cool idea. Kidnapping him first. Because Rita and Zed had never done that. I'm not saying they were... I'm not saying it was an original idea. But I'm saying that... Sometimes you gotta just bl- bust out the classics, right? Sometimes you have to bust out the classics, right? But they had a little bit more forethought into their plans instead of just, oh, the Rangers are having a bad day and they're talking about pizza. I'm gonna make a pizza monster kind of a thing. <laughs> Foreshadowing. Yes, I did that on purpose. Yeah. Best episode in the Zorro Aaron. Fight me. Um, I just. I Not exactly know. a high bar. Yeah, it's true. Um, I, I genuinely believe had Gasket and Archerina stuck around, then they would have just been Mondo and Machina light. Like, sure. Um, so it, it's like asking me to to pick between apples and oranges. They're both fruit. You know what I mean. Fair enough. As for my thoughts on Prince Sprocket as a villain. Um, an annoying little. I can't say the other. <laughs> just annoying. Yeah, and not in a good way. Like yep. he has. Wait, how can you be annoying in a good way? Well, because you can. Uh, the point is, you can have a character that's written to be annoying, that is annoying and makes you want to hate him, but you love to hate him. So Rito, basically. Yeah. So yeah. Rito Repulso is a, a perfect example, or Bulk and Skull in the first season. Yeah. Right. But Sprocket is just annoying. I mean, yeah. on, on occasion, like like Sprocket does come up with some good ideas here or there, but his ideas kind of get shanghaied by Mondo or Gasket. Yeah. Or 90% yeah. of the time, he'll uh, steal, like, Clank's plan. Yep. Yeah. And say it was his plan. Yeah. We see that right in, like, the beginning of Zeo right away. It's yeah. even in the opening. Yep. Yeah. Like he's he's definitely the archetype. Like like I knew kids in like the second and third grade that were like him that I just want. I, ugh, I just did not like. He, him. he was a much worse version of Finster. Let's put it that way. No, he wasn't. Well, no, 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 no. He was a worse version of Squat and Babu. Yeah, there it is. I always kind of consider Clank and Orbis as the Squat and Babu. Mm. No, there's. I think they're, it's one you to make. They are Finster. Mm. I, 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 Sprocket is Sprocket is that kid. When there's a gang of bullies, yeah, Sprocket is that one kid that stands back and goes, "Yeah, tell him, boss, that's Sprocket." <laughs> oh my that god, that is Sprocket. He's, he's the kid with the hat from a Christmas yeah. story. Yeah, that's totally him. Yeah. Um, there's a disturbing I, thought. I, I, did I miss something, by the way? Like, because I know that the Machine Empire they can make a soldier like one an hour. Yep. Did, did I miss where they were making the monsters of the week? By the way, or like, were they just showing off up? screen? Yeah, like, it just... I There's think, a very simple explanation. Yeah. Well, I think certain ones, like Leaky Fawcett, I think, was one of the few that was done on screen. Yeah, because they took a costume from um, 
the the one where Rocky was like, if they just saw how good of an actor I was. Oh God, I hated that episode. Anyways, um, but it was a Rocky episode. It was a Rocky episode. Um, it was very Rocky. Yes. <laughs> In more ways than one. Um, so Thank my, you, Brian. That was the joke. Yes. <laughs> uh, so my next question is: So much like in season two of Mighty Morphin, when tons of people were teased as the potential White Ranger, we have a lot of people who are teased to be the new Gold Ranger this season. Tommy's brother, David Trueheart, Ab and Tanya's friend Raymond, Skull, and the person that should have been the new Gold Ranger, Billy. Disagree. What are your thoughts on these potential candidates? And don't forget, Sean, the boyfriend Sean, of Tanya, uh, was I didn't also, count him. He kind of got. He kind of was yeah. in that kind of red herring field yeah. for a little bit. Honestly, should have been the Gold Ranger. It's totally Raymond. Yeah, um, but like, like I would have Ra- accepted that as well. White Ranger should have been Skull. Gold yep. Ranger should have been Raymond. Yep. Honestly, I don't remember any of these characters. That's not gonna you lie. didn't do any of those episodes. <laughs> I did all of them. <laughs> I yeah, did the I entire s- Gold Ranger saga. Except for the reveal of who actually is the Gold Ranger, because Mike and I reviewed that one. Nope. Yeah. Nope. The Jason reveal? No, nope. the, rev- the reveal of Trey of Triforia, I oh, did it. no. Because it happens on Aquator. Yes. What I mean is the who takes over oh, the right. art. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. The Jason reveal was made. And Let, let's like, be honest. There are technically two Gold Ranger arcs. One, who is the Gold Ranger, and then two, who will be the who, new Gold Ranger. Who will Ranger. become the new, the new Gold, Gold Ranger. Ranger. And it should have been Raymond. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, any other thoughts on that? Uh, it shouldn't have been Jason. He should have stayed away from my Power Rangers. Well, that, At that, his peace conferences. <laughs> plural. I cannot get over that. Um, so my next question is thoughts on the Trader Triforia gimmick and the actual successor of the powers returning Ranger Jason Scott then. Well, I think we just got our answer from Well, ben. I want to ignore the Jason Scott thing because we technically covered that. But the Trader Triforia, I actually like the idea of the whole, like the backstory idea. Mm-hmm. Like the, the three divisions and stuff like that like that was kind of cool and then like the fact that it caused him because of, of the beating that he took it caused him to split into three and the fact that it was actually legitimately played by triplets yeah which, that is that is actually very that, cool. that was actually kind of cool and the fact that they were able to work around that i actually thought that was kind of nice yeah i will say i felt that it was a lot of build-up for not the greatest payoff because we had all of these red herrings, right? And Billy kept disappearing and whatnot. And then all of a sudden, and, and the Gold Ranger is nobody we'd ever met. Like, if they had at least, like, maybe planted him even in the background of something, then we could have been like, oh, that was the dude that was, like, we're looking at the Rangers in the park or something. Well, well, the other bigger problem was is that, like, in the case of, like, Billy, you know, one of the stories is that Billy along with Alpha and Zordon, built the Zeozords. And yet somehow it magically works with Pyramidus. Like, how did Trey of Triforia know that? So... There's a very simple explanation. We're, we're hitting on a lot of things I covered in the episodes surrounding the, the Gold Ranger. Right. But Sasha hit on what is probably the most important thing to discuss here. Especially for a bunch of adults that are taking a kid's show way too seriously. <laughs> right? As a kid, you don't care that they didn't see the mystery properly. Right? But as an adult, if you are going to set up a mystery and gradually drop clues, those clues have to help you solve the mystery. Right. Right? Instead, what they did was we're going to set up this mystery, we're going to drop a bunch of clues, and then the person who done it is a character you've never met before. And you're like, I hate you. For the record, this is how not to write a murder mystery. Correct. On top of that, the biggest crime that the whole arc committed is it was eight episodes of the Earthbound Power Rangers trying to figure out who the Gold Ranger was. And the eventual reveal of who the Gold Ranger was happened... To the Equation Rangers on Aquatar. Yep. And the Rangers found out on a viewing globe. Yeah. And I felt really cheap and awful. I, I'll yeah. give you that one, yeah. Like, you actually actively see 
the Rangers doing sleuthing. Like, they're using the computers, trying to work things out, track Pyramidus and all of that. And it ends up that he just crash lands on Tri- on Aquatar, and he's like, oh, I'm me. It, it's literally like the greatest game of where's Waldo or where in the world is Carmen San Diego, and then it's just... And then the it's the you think letdown. you're hunting for Carmen San Diego, and then it turns out it's not even Carmen San Diego. It's somebody else who is using a red. Playing Hollywood Squares. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you fool. Um, X gets the square. <laughs> um. So, so my next question then. Um. So I, I had a question here. I think I'm going to skip it just because you brought it up. No, no, no. Ask it. Okay. Um, thoughts on the Zords and the BS Ultra Zord combination this season? There were Zords this season? Yeah, there were multiple. One of them was a wheel. Uh, mm. I love the wheel. <laughs> Let's invent no, the wheel. No, it's my no, best no, friend no. wheel. Woo! No, 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 no. Billy no. was so Billy was so bored this season that he reinvented the wheel literally. <laughs> the answer is no. Um, oh my god. Look, I didn't... I felt like we never really... Like, I like animal-based zords more than anything else. Yeah. Because, you know, I just... Oh, I you're like going to be disappointed next season. I already... Well, yes, I know it's Cars. It's not like I haven't watched this in before. Car-inca. But Cars are fine to me, even though... The, the wheel, however, was completely stupid. But I didn't feel like we really got any connection to the Zords in any way. Yeah. Um, and not to say that we need an emotional connection to a hunk of metal that we used to pilot, you know. But it definitely, like, I don't know. I just didn't care for the Zords. I didn't, just didn't care at all. That's fine. I thought I thought they were shiny, at least. And I, I, I love how they uh, give um, Tommy the one Zord, the battle Zord. Where it has to sync up with his mind. Yeah. And he has to pilot it. But then later on, that they're able to just... Billy just kind of goes, Yeah, we're just going to rework it a little bit so Adam can use it. Well, that was an emergency situation, yeah. though. And but, but it was nice, though, that they... That I mean, he didn't think that... He didn't know if it was actually going to work or not. And so it only worked temporarily. Thing. Because yeah. it but, was supposed to sync up to Tommy's mind. But I guess the question is, why have a Zord that only syncs up to one Ranger in the first place? I mean, because Tommy... Because, oh, that's right! I forgot. This is the Tommy Tommy's the best show. Power Ranger of all time, guys. Because, ah. because this is the Tommy Show featuring the oh. Power Rangers. Yep. Yeah. I actually cannot wait until we get to Turbo, and he's like barely in it. Thank to you. ask to answer your question, however, um, one of the things that the previous seasons of Power Rangers did very well was giving context to the Zords. Right. Right. Every set of Zords we got, there was some form of context to them. Be it the Shogun Zords, being ancient Zords, be it the Thunder Zords, being it the Ninja Zords, or the original the original Zords themselves. Yeah, the Dinozords. Zeo, we just get to the end of Zeo beginning, and, and Tommy's like, well, we don't have any Zords, so... If something gets big, we're, we're, we're boned. <laughs> and t- Billy's like, oh, we're working on something. And then they just have Zords. <laughs> like the next episode. And, and, and that kind of blows my mind now that I really think about it. It's like, because every other subsequent Power Ranger team has Zords, or at the very least, they can go on like a quest to find them. But Zeo seems to be the only team, as far as I know, where they have the powers. They don't have any Zords yet. And it's like, why? That like, makes no sense. If I may. Sure. Please. Um, I don't think the Zeo Crystal was intended to be a power source for Power Rangers. I think Zordoth's improvising. Mm, that I can buy that. And one of the other things that's really interesting is not only are we given context to the previous Zords, we're given reasons that certain Zords are given to certain people. Right. And why they're needed in the first place. Right. Whereas they're just assigned these random Zords. Yeah. Like, why do Tanya and Kat have Zords that look like, that are just tanks that need to be pulled by someone else? Why does, why does Rocky get to drive a Sphinx? Why is Tommy flying a bird again? Yeah. They're very, there's no scene. Because the the showrunners want to give us the bird with Tommy. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but that goes back to the other point, right? That there's sort of there's no 
there's no there's no connection right but there's no central theme in the same way that like either do cars or do animals right right yeah. you shouldn't do both like lightspeed rescue it makes no sense for them to have animal vehicles because Correct. it's a military setup right same thing with time force right we know why they have the zords the way that they are um same thing within space even turbo had cars and it stuck to the car theme for better or worse but here and i think there's a season later on that also does this i think it's ninja steel where there's just no everything is sort of random that one i can i'm not going to get into it but there that one does make sense in context if you do a little research but um uh, the, the the biggest problem I think was because Zio was one thing and O Ranger was another and like they the the, the the source material Sentai has some really weird things going on like they're not tanks that Cat and Tanya have they're like Easter Island heads in the O Rangers and so like I don't know how well that translates here but it doesn't it, yeah, yeah it's just yeah. Okay, cool. Sir, some things from the Sentai translate well. Some things yeah. just don't. It's, it's always a 50 thing from the Sentai that translates well. Uh, pff, you got me. The utilization of the dinosaurs. Oh, are we talking In about Zoo Ranger? No, no, no. Zoo Ra- Zoo Ranger. I'm, t- I'm talking uh, about this, this one. season. O-Ranger. Okay, I cannot speak on this season because I have yet to see uh, this season in the Sentai, there's, so I can't speak on that. There's very little that really translates here from O-Ranger. When Brian was talked about it when we did the season the opener, like O-Ranger as a series is kind of dark. Yeah. Zeo is not. Well, well, the Sentai We're not general, allowed to do too dark in Power Rangers. Well, well, keep in mind, the Sentai has always been, from yeah. Drew Ranger up to a certain point... Sentai was pretty dark in general. Like, if you watch Drew Ranger, which is what the first season of Mighty Morphin's based off of, that is a dark yeah. show. Although it did have that light moment when the putties rang the doorbell, then came in and stormed the, well, stormed just, the house. That was, just, like, that was like one of the few comedy. silly moments, but like, it was a dark but, show. Yeah, I, and again, like, it, the way that I have a rule that I keep with Power Rangers when I'm trying to think about how translation works, and this is totally, I'm, I'm going to get back on track here, but like, for me, with Power Rangers compared to Super Sentai, I have a rule that I pull from George of the Jungle, which is that nobody dies, they just get really big boo-boos. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's just the way it works for me. <laughs> so, are, are we talking Brendan Fraser? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. As long as we're talking about the good one. We're, we're uh, yes. Um, okay, so my next question is, um, so we have a few new allies this season. Oric the Conqueror, the Trey after four, to name a few. But we also get a returning ally, Ancestra, the blue Aquitian Ranger from Aquatar, who whisks Billy away for a while. Should this have been the way that Billy gets written off compared to the way he actually gets written off? I would say Graduation Blues probably would have been a better way of writing off Billy. Yeah. yeah. Because especially the fact that it kind of left it with a little bit of a cliffhanger because the Rangers were actually disappointed that they weren't able to say goodbye. Right. And I think that probably would have been a little bit of a better send off for Billy than what we ended up getting. Yeah. Because we got like old man Billy. Well, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not like Billy's departure was actually planned. It wasn't the story that, for reasons that we've already talked about, um, David Yost just walked off the set one day and didn't come back? Well, I yeah. think so. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, he was being abused for being gay. Yeah. I mean, it's like. There's only so much, you know, harassment and abuse that you can take. Oh, no, 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 100%. That, no, I'm he was totally here. in the right on that. What I'm yeah. saying is that the writers sort of had to cobble some nonsense together. And that's yeah. why we have the crappy ending that we did. I, I honestly but, think, you know, sorry to cut you off, but I honestly think when they did Graduation Blues, I think that was probably the original walk off by by david yost and uh, because he is legitimately gone for like four episodes what i kind of would like about that too is because billy says hey i'm gonna be here as a mentor and i'm gonna you know he's helping out zordon with like the zords and all that and helping and then all of a sudden like what happens when suddenly he's gone when your brain is suddenly gone like what happens then they have to do so much improvising and i'm sure a lot of that's going to fall back on zordon and alpha five at that point but at the same time like, the culture shock of that, like, just having... Well, not culture shock, but just the shock of it. Having Billy just gone all of a sudden, and... Yeah, oh, but man. it doesn't ultimately affect the Rangers. Yeah. They just sort of get over it two seconds later. Um, but to go back to your earlier question, because you were asking about the new allies that were introduced. Yes. Um, 
I just, I, I asked this question when the character was introduced, and I'm still confused. Why is he called the Conqueror? <laughs> he he should have, yeah. He doesn't conquer. He's a nice guy. He conquers villainy. <laughs> I guess. Like, what was another name that we came up for? Instead of Conqueror, he could have been... Um, Oric the or- Great. Oric, Oric the, the de- Tickler. Oric the Defender. Oric the Amazing. Oric the, the Fearless, right? Or- Oric, Oric, Oric the Splendid. Or- Oric the I Want to Be Ninja. Or- yeah. Oric the Easily Fooled. Yeah. Yeah, right? That's actually probably the best one of them all because he was easily fooled. <laughs> right, but... I don't know. I felt like a lot of this season, there was just a little too much going on. Yeah. Right? You have Oric the Conqueror. You have Trey of Trifor. You have the Equitians. You have Rita and Lord Zed. You have Rito and Goldar. You have uh, the Machine Empire. You have Billy's Ark. I I was just... Th- I, 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 there's I, a I. lot. This is a lot, especially for a show that is like 20 minutes long each episode, you know? I, and honestly, like, that might be why I was kind of... like. Even as a kid, I was just like, my initial watch through, I was like, wait, what just happened? Like, because I remember, I remember certain things visually, but like, it took me a while to go, oh yeah, that's right, that's what happened in this episode. Because like, it it was just like, it's a blur, and like, you blink and it's gone. Like, characters like, um, characters like Raymond are there one minute and they're gone the next. Um, You know, Tommy's brother is there for like, three or four episodes. We get so many people that just like. Let's put it in perspective. JD, JDF's real life brother <sighs> got more episodes than Raymond. Oh. What a surprise! Napitas man action. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Ah, uh, God. Um. I got two more questions, and then I'll open it up to discussion for everybody. If you want to do that, sounds like we kind of don't. <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because we got not st- wrong. We got steak waiting for us. So um, steak, but, yeah, steak. Mmm, steak. Hmm, mm, I want mine medium rare. All um, right, Ninja, get to your question. So okay, <laughs> sorry, I had. I know you mentioned him. I had to do something. Um, this finale, for a lack of a better word, sucked. <laughs> We were being led to the Turbo movie directly after this, but seeing Jason walk off with his new girlfriend and Tommy with Cat just seemed... And then the very next time you see him, he's hanging out with Kim. Yeah, it just seemed like how not to end a season, question mark? Well, yeah, but also it... The the machine the Rangers ultimately actually like, for all of the praise that Mighty Morphin gets right and all of the nostalgia BS and all of the like they're the greatest Here Rangers of all time. Here we go. They've never actually defeated a villain, right? Like like they never defeated Rita and Lord Zed. They don't defeat the Machine Empire. Nope. They don't defeat. Um, well, that's not the them. Cops. That's a different but set of characters. De- but but, uh, well, I'm just talking about the Zordon era in general, right? The, the Rangers in the Zordon era don't get a, a W, a, a strike in the W column until in space. Yep. And it's not to say they haven't had wins, right? They've defeated other villains that have been brought in by Rita to do other things, but they've never unalived any of them. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, and so. I'm, this season didn't have a finale, and then what they could have done, and then ultimately they don't even defeat the Machine Empire. Rita and Zed do that for them. As they're driving off in their Winnebago. And they say... It's a Winnebago. <laughs> I mean, Winnebagos are pretty destructive. I, I do. I love how Lord Zed's As long like, as you got a good Schwartz, you'll be fine. I was literally going to say, <laughs> someone find me Lone Star. Yay. Just, you know, try not to go plaid. Um, I'm my own best friend. Um, <laughs> the... Uh, I, I love how Lord Zed said, we're back, and then, like, totally. But you never see him again. <laughs> you never, you don't well, see him until s- 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 uh, in space. In space. Yeah. Similarly, doesn't at the end of the uh, Zeo beginning that he says something like, oh, I'll be back, we'll be back, or I'll be back, and I'm like, uh-huh, sure. I'll believe it when I see it, Crowface. I know you see uh, Rita for a little while in the Turbo premiere. She, she's Diva, in the movie. Because Diva Tox calls her. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's because they're supposed to be. I think in the show they're sisters or something. No, 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 no. The implication is her and Demetria are sisters. Oh yeah. We're yeah, already talking right. about Turbo. But it does. Con- <laughs> but that being said, 
said, though, that scene with that we'll get to when we suffer through the Turbo movie, um, it does set up the idea that there... It continues the idea of the United Alliance of Evil, right? Yeah. That all of these bad guys know each other, they communicate with each other, and there's sort of a bigger picture of evil going on. They're, they're in a Facebook group chat together. <laughs> they got a WhatsApp group. <laughs> yeah. Guys, guys, they're on MySpace together. Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> they are evil. <laughs> Rita, why am I not in your top eight? God. <laughs> Thank you, Goldar. Uh, <laughs> uh, my final question. What did you actually like about this season? Instrument of Destruction. It ended! <laughs> no, well, it didn't end, but... Well, no, no, in, in a serious sense. It's like, here's where all going to say, oh, because it's oh, the season's yeah, over. Yeah. Instrument of Destruction, hands down... Um, because it's one of the episodes, like, because we haven't really talked about it on this episode, but we've talked about it a lot in other episodes. This season, Bulk and Skull regressed a lot. Yep. But this one particular episode was really good, not just for Skull, because it was a Skull-centric kind of episode, but for Bulk as well, because, you know, you know, because it, it's also an Adam episode at the same time, but, like, it just made skull a much better character after having to be regressed throughout most of the season and then have this high high moment and you know and it seems like skull has that high moment at least one episode a season that he gets that so but yeah instrument of destruction is probably one of the better highlights of the season in my opinion sure to give a serious answer and then they give the uh, honest answer that the season's over <laughs> Um, to give a to give a more a less sarcastic answer, other than the season is over, um, there are a, there are some things to like in this season, and one of the things that there is to like in this season is there's more shades of the show not taking itself seriously, mm -hmm. which is when the pre in space <coughs> Power Rangers are at their best. When the show isn't taking itself too seriously, is when like Turbo and before is at its best. Sure, I agree with that. And they weren't afraid to lean into it with like it came from Angel Grove, and while it may not have been the most lovely thing to listen to, the musical episode, like there were just nope, nope, nope. Like I said, it doesn't necessarily mean they sang it well, but the fact that they were willing to go and do that. Nope. Nope. You don't think that's a good thing? Nope. I mean, that episode was completely 100,000% well, no, no. not necessary. But, but Ben's no, point no, that's is... not what I'm saying. I'm not yeah. saying that the episode was necessary. I'm saying that the writers were willing to look at themselves and go, let's do something stupid. Let's have some fun with it. I mean, let's and, have and, some fun. And in honest, it's not a and I'm okay with, I'm and okay in with honesty, that. And in honesty... You kind of saw it near the end of season three, like the one monster that made the Rangers dance. Like yeah. you kind of saw it a little bit starting to come a little bit, but this one took it to that next level. So why level. do you not think that's a good thing? <sighs> I like balance in my storytelling a little bit more. Right, but and you can't have a balance if you're taking yourself seriously all I the time. I understand that. But I think that there is sort of going too far in the other direction. And right. so, to again, me, I'm not saying that the music episode was the way to do it. Right. What I'm saying is the writers were able to hold a mirror up to themselves and go, we may have taken ourselves a bit too seriously previously. I mean, look, I'm looking at you, Mighty Morphing Season 2. Yeah. Um, but they did things that were fun in a way that weren't just, this monster makes the rangers dance, or this monster turns the rangers into footballs, or... Okay, the one thing I will say is I did like sort of the silliness of the purse monster. Yeah. yeah. See, that... Okay, okay, so maybe, for me, I had the gripe with the musical episode specifically then. So, sure. But I do, I can appreciate some of the monster silliness more than I think I mean, the ranger silliness. Look at it came from Angel Grove. I don't know if that I consider that silly, but it's definitely different. And I don't it's know if it's absolutely silly. It's a bunch of rangers acting in monster movies. Like, right, but it's all a dream sequence. Yes, but it's still silly. 
fine. Then I, I guess maybe I wouldn't use the word silly to describe it, but I see what you're saying. Like, I, I, I can t- absolutely see, like, you know, maybe you're having a bad day. Because, like, I remember, you know, you'd come home from school and you'd turn on the TV and, like, you know, if you watch too many episodes in a row that are, like, super serious and, like, they're taking themselves too seriously, sometimes you just need to laugh. Sometimes you just need something that's, you know, oh, wow, I needed 20 minutes to, like, look at something that was kind of silly. And maybe that's what they were thinking. Maybe, but I think it's also difficult because we don't watch it that way now. So our perceptions and impressions are going to be a little bit different. But I get your... Yeah, yeah, when it was being made like that back in the 90s, like, that could have been... Something also to keep in mind is that, like, and I know this because, like, when I was going through boxes, cleaning out stuff, like, I found the old TV guides... That actually had Power Rangers on the cover. Right. And Your one of the... parents kept those? Um, my mom actually collected TV guides. Wow. But, um, and she gave me some that I knew I would keep, like TMNT and Power Rangers. But, I have some but, anyway, but anyways... We the, don't get that too in space, dude. But, the, but anyways, the thing is, though, is that like one of the biggest things that was always talked about in every single TV guide was the parents was never about the kids' entertainment. It was always about the parents always having concern about the violence and stuff like yeah. that. And I maybe, remember that. I and absolutely this, remember and that. And this probably was the first season where they actually kind of wanted to do more of that silliness of, like, the singing and the dancing and the, so, so when it's and playing, the, and the other stuff. When it's playing in the living room, your parents don't come in and go, oh, my God. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, you're still going to have yeah. the Zord battles and stuff like that. And Which, it's probably one of the reasons why we didn't see that many unmore fights. Yeah. Well, I think that was the result of the Sentai footage. That probably, probably. was also a result of the Sentai footage, but I wouldn't put it past the idea of the fact of the parents and stuff like that as well. Again, yeah, so we, like, without being back then, we won't know. Yeah. But yeah. like I said, it, it especially going into a season like Turbo, being able to show your audience that Power Rangers doesn't have to be serious 24-7 is a very good thing to prepare people for, well, Diva Tox is about to happen. But at the same <laughs> time, a lot of people constantly talk about Mighty Morphin's, like, ridiculousness and its silliness. So, maybe there is space for it to be take itself a little bit more seriously. Right, but sure. what they're looking at is they're not looking at... No, what, I understand what they're looking at. I'm just saying what I'm looking at. Right, but you're saying people say, right? So, I'm talking about those people at this point. They're looking at Mighty Morphin saying it's silly because it hasn't aged well. Fair. And because a lot of what makes the monsters effective for the kids doesn't make them effective for adults that doesn't make the storyline silly that doesn't make the plot silly it makes the monsters doing things silly right like turning them into footballs or turning them into chemicals or making them dance or whereas something like it came from angel grove or this musical episode it it's more the unmorphed rangers getting silly than the morphed rangers getting silly. Yeah. Because, okay. because at that point... But we've beaten this story to death. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, did anybody else want to talk about anything else? Did they have any other thoughts about Zio? Vulcan Skull. Well, Mike sort of started the ball rolling when he said earlier that, like, we... I they think regressed. every episode, yeah, they regressed. We saw them in doing, like, you know... We re ranted in the premiere and the opening about this whole concept of them taking Bul- uh, Goldar and Rito as their slaves. Yeah. Right? But there are moments where they do shine, right? Like yeah. when at the end they take their detective's exam in the middle of a monster fight and they're like, oh, this is part of the test. I'm like, yes, because the, the detective exam people care and are going to set this up just for you guys. But it showed, you know, some good, like, working under pressure and all that jazz, so they were able to pass their detective exam. Yeah. And they genuinely cared about helping people. Yes. And yeah. that part yeah. still carried around. They didn't really care about, uh, you know, monsters, which is fair, because I don't give two f- fudges about uh, <laughs> about Rito and Goldar either. But we... So there is a little bit of a regression, um, but at the core, their evolution is like it. Like 
But like it's not said, just it's a, a regression arc. of Bulk and Skull themselves. Right. It's a regression of Bulk and Skull and their relationship to everyone in Angel Grove. Because we get, yeah. like, we end season three with the Rangers at their graduation ceremony actively saying, we're proud of Bulk and Skull. Yep. You get to a Zeo beginning and beyond, and they're back to just antagonizing Bulk and Skull again. With at least one exception. Well, yeah. the early season, the uh, in, in the early part of the season, yeah, and then it sort of changes in the middle of the season, and then goes back at the end. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this was the season, by the way, I believe, where uh, the season of finale they get um, they get kind of escorted out by a uh, Peter Sellers wannabe uh, Pink Panther, yeah, um, Inspector Clouseau type, and. You know, it's like, would you like to go to France or whatever and, like, be part of our agency? And I believe that that was supposed to be for a backdoor pilot. A Bulk and Skull spinoff, yeah. And apparently everybody at Fox was like, this is not good. Well, they made a pilot. And the pilot did. But the pilot was a straight-to-video clip show. Mm. And if that had done well, they were going to commission a Bulk and Skull series. But it was a a straight-to-video clip show. And the clips were all of not Bulk and Skull, and they were stuck in a cave the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, I never owned that, probably for good Well, reason. no, no, no. So the tape that was made, the straight to tape, yeah. was sent directly to the studio execs. It wasn't something uh, that wasn't put out yeah. publicly. So they didn't test it then for no. an audience. Yeah, well, they, they also didn't sort of think didn't try. through. Yeah, they didn't try, right? It yeah. was sort of they, like... I, I think Saban didn't want to try. To be honest, I think it was something. I think it was something where the studio execs were like, "We really like the characters of Bulk and Skull. We like Paul and Jason. You know the actors. You know, let's see what they can do." And I think Saban was given it to do that, and he didn't want to try because he didn't want to make a focus on those two guys. He didn't want to take Bulk and Skull away from. It's one of the reasons you don't see Bulk and Skull interact with the Rangers that much in the last half of the season of Zeo. Yeah. It's because they wanted to get used, get you used to the fact that Bulk and Skull wouldn't be around the Rangers. Which... When they moved to yeah. the spinoff. Yeah. And then they come back and get turned into monkeys. But that's next season. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. Um, I think I'm... I'm kind of done with the season. How about y'all? Yep. I was done with the season when Louis Kaboom showed up. Yeah. I was done with this season about four episodes in. Yeah, really, though. <laughs> really? I was done with this season when Tanya became a ranger. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's be fair. So, technically, episode two, officially. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, then, let's go ahead and start wrapping it up, then. Um, so, let's see. Sasha, where, yes. can we, where can we find you on the World Wide Web? Uh, crying in a corner. No. <laughs> uh- <laughs> hey, 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 hey. That's my line. Uh, no, actually, it's mine. Nope. Um, she stole so your spot, man. I you know. can find she me. Stole your you can find me over on Twitter at Geeky Kaplan. That is Kaplan with a K after the greatest superhero in the Marvel Universe, Billy Kaplan. Fight me. Um, you can also find this show on Twitter as well, which is VFTG underscore PR. And you can also find me on Tumblr. I'm the only one of the voices from the grid cast on Tumblr, and that is geekgirl 101tumblrcom I am usually complaining about the lack of Jewish representation. All right, Mike, where can we find you, sir? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at the Lindenbaum75, Facebook at facebook.com slash x75 productions, Twitch doing the gaming thing at the twitch.tv slash the Michael X75. Technically, X75 Productions does have an active Tumblr. It's X75 Productions. It's I'm just not. an automatic one that just posts things without any commentary, nobody so don't cares, bother. Yeah. Nobody cares. And then nobody course, cares. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. I mean, it is Tumblr after yeah, all. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But, but then, <laughs> and then uh, obviously everything's over at txhthockey.com. And then go to X75 Productions on the site for all the stuff. All right. Uh, as for myself, you can find me on TikTok at Blue Ranger underscore B Rye. You can find me at um, you can find me on Twitter at One Drunk Geek. You can also find me at castwaystudios.com, friends of the studio for many, many years. Check out Bowling Go Nowhere and One Drunk Geek and all kinds of 
fun stuff that we've got planned for the future. And Ben, I left you for last, sir. Where can we find you? Just just don't find me. Just leave me alone. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You can find me on Twitter at, at Bob T. Goldfish. You can find me doing the video game thing at twitch.tv slash 321 underscore TV. And you can find the sister show to Voices from the Grid, Awesome Mania, the pay-per-view watch-along podcast for wrestling in the 90s over at at txhchockey.com slash x95 production slash awesome mania all right and with that then oh wait 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 wait, wait no and then you can follow the show oh yeah at vftt underscore pr on twitter and on the website at txhchockey.com slash vftg and <laughs> huh what <laughs> <laughs> Sasha got caught looking at her phone. Spotify and Google Podcast. <laughs> we are also on Spotify and Apple. Was Google. it Apple Pod- Google. Google Podcast? Google Podcast. Apple does She's, not we, like to cooperate. It's only been the whole season that we've been on Google Podcast. Yeah. I always get those confused. I'm sorry. I don't actually, ironically enough, I don't listen to podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only on them. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. All right. So. It has been a long, strange journey. And we will see you in our very next episode when myself, Michael, Brian, and Sasha shift into Turbo. And we will leave you this time by saying, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, the words of the 16th President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, be excellent to each other. A party on non-gender specific honorifics. And until our next Morph Anomal episode, be sure to grab your Zeonizers and your Zeo Crystals. And may the power protect you. Shift into turbo! <laughs>